Hey guys, welcome to Gutsy Media Podcast, episode two. My guest today was Lauren Mueller. We discussed the 2012 crime drama Killing Em Softly, starring Brad Pitt. Had some great debates about the likability of this film. If you like this episode, check out our other collabos over there on Those Geeks You Know with Dave Lee and Casey, all part of DFAT Media. When traveling geekly, make sure you never forget a towel. And without further ado, on with the show. What's up? Not much. I ordered um I ordered a microphone and I ordered a uh new pair of headphones. Nice. But kinda cheap on both ends. So yeah. the microphone is just gonna sit on my desk. Like I like your setup, but I don't have the ability to do that right now. And I can't even imagine how much one of those arms is. Seventeen dollars, Amazon. The arm is seventeen dollars. Yep. Wow. Yeah, All it right. was. I saw that. And I was like, "This is an awesome deal," and it works amazingly. I really like it a lot. Yeah, that's uh something. Hi, Jen. I'm sure she can't hear me because you have headphones on. She cannot hear can't you. Just... Lauren says hi. She said hi. <laughs> so, I I'm excited. Um, my guest today is Lauren Mueller. Oh, my we're just starting. Co-host. <laughs> Uh, on uh, those geeks you know we go way back um, is not only in our knowing each other but in our love for movies and everything geek related uh, the movie that we picked was Killing Them Softly which which I'm excited about and, and le- here's why I'm excited okay. because much like you I watched this movie and afterwards was like that was a really dumb movie like I didn't hate it but it was like it was dumb. It was it was pointless. There was the plot was eh. And then I did an immense amount of research on the movie for this podcast. And it started to turn me a little bit. I mean, I'm not gonna say that it's a good movie, but I have much more appreciation for it with all the research I did. All right. Well, I'm just gonna say I sat down and watched it. And I had my <laughs> little notepad to take some notes. So there's there's some very quickly you jotted down notes that I probably should have reread before we did this, but you know, um, yeah, let's, let's just, uh, see how this goes. Um, yeah. So excited. Killing, killing them softly. Killing them softly. This is, this star is Brad Pitt, a uh, very does. well-known movie star. He also produced the movie. I don't know if you knew that. I did. Um, writer and director, Andrew Dominic. Dominique, I think that's how you pronounce it. Uh, he's done. He's done a lot of good movies. He the most well known movie, uh, The Assassination of Jesse James, also starring Brad Pitt. They, I don't want to call them friends, uh, acquaintances. Um, they have a mutual respect. This this movie uh, first airs at Cannon Film Festival in May of 2012, which is held what? in in France. Um. When Brad, so Brad owns a production company, so he produced the movie. He loves kind of gra- grabbing films that have a difficult time getting made. Um, and filmmakers like Andrew, who uh, he says he believes in and admires. This is what he says during the interview afterwards. Um, this movie's based on a book. Did you know that? I did not. So the original book, um, I believe, is called like Cargo's Way or I'm, I'm butchering that name. Um, let me see if I can find the actual title. Yeah, Kogan's, C-O-G-A-N. Kogan's, Kogan's Trade. Kogan's Trade, yes. What did I say? Gotcha. Kogan's Way? Is that what yep. I meant? But it's okay. I got gotcha. you. So, so it's, a, it's a mafia movie. Um, yeah. Yep. Are, you, are you a fan of mafia movies? Um, I mean... I will watch them if they're on, but I'm not going to, I don't dislike them, but I can't say that I have many that I like go out and be, I would be like, Oh, Hey, let's watch this movie right so now. Goodfellows, Godfather. Have you seen, have you seen all the classic ones like that? You haven't seen no. the, which one? Both? 
any of them. Oh my God. What are you doing? We should have do watched remember, one of like, those. Do you remember like maybe these listeners would have, uh, would recognize us from another podcast. I know you mentioned uh, those geeks, you know, where every episode you guys yell at me for not having seen a whole bunch of movies. So what, what kills me though, is that your, your pop culture knowledge and movie knowledge is pretty vast, but yet you've seen no movies. Yeah. How it, it goes through <laughs> yeah, osmosis, it's weird. just that's crazy. It's just, I if I find a movie, I like to I'll do the background research on it and then I will kind of get more knowledge about other things, even though I haven't seen them. And then, you know, my friend group kind of is a little bit geeky, as you may say. <laughs> Being one of my friends. <laughs> That's true. I, I mean there's there's a, a ton of movies that I've kind of I don't want to say I haven't watched, like physically, visually seen, but I've done research on or I've read the plot synopsis and it's like, oh, that yeah. was a good movie, even though I've never seen it. Well, so again, for the listeners, um, so Bob and I know each other from uh, way back when, when we used to mo- work at a movie store together called Family Video, which Bob, it's been 11 years. It, it's nuts. Uh, anyway, you start it. We were just like young Weird. little whippersnapper back then. Now we're all <laughs> old. Right? Um, <laughs> but anyways, one of my favorite pastimes when it wasn't busy was one of two games that we used to play. One was we would name an actor or actors, and we would have to go find a movie with those people in it. Or the other was Bob would just randomly pick a movie and tell me the whole synopsis of that movie. Good and. Time. I loved that. Like some people would get mad and be like, you're ruining the whole movie. And I'm like, no, I, uh, if you don't know Bob as a person, he's a fantastic author, writer. Like those are, I guess those are the same. Oh, stop it. it. Oh, stop. So when you are, (laughs) when you are telling even somebody else's story, which is what you were doing when you were giving a synopsis, you got really into detail and really into maybe details that I wouldn't have picked up on myself so that was really cool to me so so this this is my goal then this is my goal my goal is to change your perspective on this movie and then right. again i'm not saying it's a good movie i'm saying that i appreciate it a lot better so should i give you my feelings before well, we do like background like how do you want me to do this we're just gonna we're just gonna go with the flow i'm i pride myself on having very little structure to the podcast i want to just kind of go where it takes us um Let's let's kind of run through the synopsis a little bit. Uh, feel okay. free to chime in or stop me at any point where you want to talk about the scene or, or what happened. So uh, Ray Liotta, who is a very well-known actor, he is a well-known mafia actor. He's been in I was like gonna almost, say, all the mafias. Yeah, every mafia movie there is. He is in the movie. He runs a casino game. A uh, uh, poker game, if you will, a yeah. mafia poker game, Perfect and I, and I'm kind of jumping in, like ten minutes into the movie. But essentially, what happens is, you got these two low level street criminals who uh, happen to know a guy who has this genius idea to rob the mafia card game, uh, run by Ray Liotta, and at first. Uh, the the two uh, street criminals are like, there's no way you can do this. They're gonna find you. They're gonna you know kill you. And this guy, I what's I think they call him like Eagle or something. What's uh he's played by um, Vincent Carlarto. His name's Johnny. Johnny. Uh, yeah, Johnny. Yeah, Johnny. I was so, gonna say basically everybody has don't they first name like Squirrel or something. Squirrel. Yep, he's Squirrel. Squirrel. That that is yeah, that's his name in the it's his nickname in the movie. So anyway, Squirrel says, "Listen, here's why we can get away with this because this game was robbed already uh, previously, uh, and it was robbed by Ray Liotta's character, who is Marky. Um, yeah, Mark Marky. Marky Trapman. So he's like he's the Trapp- only one who had got got a last name Trapman. <laughs> he is too." Uh, so Marky robs the casino, casino or robs the game a couple years ago, ends up getting away with it. Um, 
nobody suspects him. And then as some time passes, he gets drunk at one of his games and lets it slip to some, some buddies of his. Uh, for whatever reason, they say, okay, enough time has passed. We'll let bygones be bygones. And he basically they doesn't get find any. It funny. They find it funny. Which is so this is this is the one part of the plot that I find very difficult to to buy, uh, only because I don't know. I mean, I don't care how much time has passed. If you robbed a mafia, you know, card game, they're gonna come after you. But regardless, so uh, squirrel squirrel's idea is that we rob it again. They're automatically gonna blame Marky, and uh, he'll go down for it. So they do it. They rob the the game in a very comical sort of manner. They had this sawed off shotgun that is way too <laughs> sawed even, off. Yeah. Yes. It's so, just like the barrel. Like, there's yeah, no, the, yeah. The, you the can't, it looks shells, like a pistol. Yeah. The shells stick, stick out. out. That's how, which ultimately means the gun would be useless because there's no compression and therefore there could be no firing, but that's neither here nor there. So <laughs> they, they successfully robbed the game and they get away with it. And because of this, um, all the games in the city shut down and the mafia calls in Brad Pitt's character, uh, Jackie. Yay. Jackie is an enforcer, hitman type character, and they, they hire him to come in um, and figure out who robbed the game and, and get the games back up and running because everybody's losing a ton of money. He is hired by a um, mafia lawyer played by Richard Jenkins. Uh, who goes by Driver in the movie. His character is funny. He's a very funny uh, actor. He's been in a lot of things. Most notably, he plays the father in Step Brothers. Um, he, he is a mafia lawyer, but although he's a mafia lawyer, he's very, um, he's very lawyer-ish. He's very business-oriented. He talks very plainly to Jackie, which I found their relationship in the movie to be quite entertaining, um, only yeah. because it's not it's not a mafia guy talking to a hitman it's it's, it's a lawyer, lawyer talk, yeah talking, talking to, his, to his buddy i guess i mean they kind of seem like they're they're uh, i don't know I if mean, they're friends but they they have this but also big, he's definitely talking to the hitman right there's a, there's a, there's a level <laughs> so. of respect there i think so anyway one of the guys one of the the little, little crooks who i should probably mention um, he is played. Russell. Ben is... Mendelsohn. Is that who you're talking about? The sweaty uh -huh. Australian. Yeah, 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 yeah. Because that's literally what I call him. He is so sweaty in this movie. He's awesome though, Russell. He is. Yeah. You know, he's, he's, he's been in a he's ton also, of movies. I was gonna say he most recent. Well, the thing that I remember him most recently for is he is in. Uh, he's the. Villain in Ready Player One. He's yep. also in the Marvel movies. He's um, the, the guy. head scroll guy. The head scroll guy. Scroll. Yes. Yes. What's his name? I don't know. I don't uh, know Talos. Him. Talos. Talos. Yep. He's, he's also. Oh, go ahead. Come on. Come. He's also in Dark Knight Rises. I was getting there. Yep. Yeah. Um, he's not the only one in this movie that's in Dark Knight Rises either. He is not. Um, so anyway, so he ends up going on another job with another guy. His his main his main thing is he steals dogs, high high value dogs, and and turns around and sells them. So he goes on another <laughs> job with another guy, and uh, winds up telling the guy what he did and robbing the mafia game. That guy ends up being a guy who works for Jackie Brad Pitt's character. Am I missing anything so far? No, but besides the fact that uh, Russell is an idiot. Russell is an idiot. He, I love his character. I love his characters in most movies. He's a really funny actor, although he doesn't really, he's not comedic funny. He's more like. Um, it's a very dry set. Like, yeah. Most of the time it's more of like a dry rather than in your face humor. I, I agree. Yeah. It, I think it's, it's subtle. Um, so Jackie gets wind of this and he, uh, first, first he goes to Ray Liotta's character, um, Marky, and he, you know, tries to get some information out of him. Marky swears up and down. It wasn't him. And for whatever reason, the mafia guy who the, the lawyer rather, who is, um, 
giving the information from the the mafia bosses says, you know, we don't want to hurt Marky. Rough him up a little bit, but don't don't hurt him too badly. They end up putting him in the hospital. Um, and Jackie, at this point, gets wind of the other two guys and Squirrel and decides he's going to take them down. But before he can, um, what's his name? Oh, man, I'm blanking on names. This is not good. James Gandolfini. Oh, oh, I, you didn't, I even didn't get even there even yet. Get there. James Gandolfini's in this. He's amazing. This is, I think, the last movie, not not the last movie uh, he did before he died, but one of the last movies he did before he died. Um, Which, what a shame. Seriously, he's such a great actor. He gets called in by Jackie's character as kind of like a side story to help him take care of some of these guys, you know, and, and, and take them out, rub them out. But he, Jackie quickly finds out that he is a washed up hitman. He is a drunk. drunk. He, he is a He's sexaholic, depressed. depressed. Yeah. His wife just left him or something like that. He's got some his, story he, about. His wife hasn't left him. He he was in prison and his wife tried to divorce him and he refused. So his wife has basically like emotionally left, left him. <laughs> so he was like, the next time she brings out those papers, I'm just going to sign it and be done with it. But then yeah. he tells this whole sob story and this whole story about how he's basically in love with a prostitute. Which is great because he's got this scene where the prostitute comes out of the bathroom. Jackie's there in the Not hotel. Not the same prostitute. Not the same prostitute he's in love with. No. She comes out of the bathroom and tries to engage in some conversation with him. And he's more or less like, yeah, grab the money and leave. Yep. Which, which no I, no tip. <laughs> Which I bring up because that is like a an underlying metaphor during the movie is this idea of money exchange, um, which is important later on when I try to get you hooked on the movie. Is this idea of so the mafia, so the, the two low level hit or two low level uh, street thugs want to rob the casino, wanna rob the game for money. Mm-hmm. The mafia wants to, they find the guys so they can get the games turned back on because they're losing money. You got the Jackie's character, who is hiring James Gandolfini's character, and they're negotiating price in this in this hotel scene. You got the hooker who's looking for money, and James Gandolfini's like, no tip, you know that that whole thing. So anyway, uh, Squirrel, who is the guy that hired the two, uh, he's gone missing. The um, Australian guy, what's Russell. his name? Russell. He gets deported. He gets picked up on the, the dog napping charges and gets deported back to Australia. So the other guy gets picked up by Jackie and Jackie basically tells him, tell me where squirrel is and you live or don't. And I take you instead. What did you think of, of the squirrel scene? I'm trying to remember which one was the squirrel scene. So this is the one where squirrel. Oh, scene- that's where he is outside. Yeah. Okay. Um, so, I have a few thoughts that kind of tie into this scene. Um, let me... So Scotty... This isn't, this isn't the slow-mo one, right? This is the one no, outside of the car. Correct. Yeah, yep. we'll get to that one. Okay. Um, so, really, Jackie's character... So, the, the name of the, the movie is obviously Killing Them Softly. And the reason it is called that is there is a line in the movie where Jackie says he doesn't like to get too close. He likes to kill them softly, basically without getting any emotions or anything like that. It's very straightforward. We're not torturing them. It's just get the job done. Not Well, not even that. He specifically says he doesn't like to get close to them. He likes to kill them softly was really the line. <laughs> <laughs> Not necessarily word for word, but that is, that, that was what they wanted. Mm-hmm. He doesn't kill anybody softly in this movie <laughs> at all. And I wrote that in my notes. It's, like, you're very so true. Softly. So this scene, basically, Jackie goes and has, uh, uh, why can't I even remember the other guy's name? Frankie? Frankie, yep. So Jackie has Frankie drive him over to Squirrel's house, or to his girlfriend, whatever, their right, house. That, that's where Squirrel is. He's hiding out with his girlfriend. Yeah. So he is walking to his car, and Jackie basically pulls up next to him, 
and shoots it. Or not next to him. Sorry, this is the one where he gets out of the car and yeah, shoots he's him like, from the roof of the car. Right. So he's like across the parking lot and shoots him with a shotgun, which which not puts, it does not work. It, 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 does not puts, work. it puts Squirrel down, but it doesn't kill him. Who's and shooting somebody from across the street with a shotgun? Right. So so the line and then in the he movie, walks over and shoots him in the head with the shotgun. So Jack, the line in the movie is Jackie's talking to Driver, who is the mafia lawyer, and Jackie says, "You ever kill anyone?" Driver says, "No." Jackie says, "You can't get too touchy feely," and, and Driver says, "Touchy feely." He says, "Emotional, not fun. A lot, a lot of fuss. They cry, they plead, they beg, they piss themselves, they call for their mothers. It gets embarrassing. I, I like to kill them softly from a distance, not close enough for feelings." Don't like feelings. Don't want to think about them. So from across the street, I get it. He's trying to kill him softly. But I like the fact that it's across the street with a shotgun. With a shotgun. Right. That so, doesn't, like, that doesn't so he, work. And then he walks up to him once, <laughs> once, well, he's got once squirrel is incapacitated and shoots him in the head with a shotgun. He's, so, you know, he's super soft in both meanings of the word. Like, you can go two, two ways here. Killing them softly, like, okay, I'm going to be gentle with you, and I'll put you down easy. Or softly, as in, like, the tone. No, no. Right. I'm going to shoot you from across the street with a shotgun so I don't have to deal with your feelings. And then I'm going to walk up and shoot you in the head with a shotgun. So Right. Softly. Mm, yeah, yeah. Maybe, maybe in he both pulls sense. the trigger softly. It's a, it's a small squeeze. It's just a quick squeeze. Gentle squeeze. So he gets back in the car with Frankie. Frankie is played by Scoot McNary, who is also the paraplegic from Batman vs. Superman, the one that blows up the Congress building. What? I didn't yeah. know that. Didn't, what? Show. It's a great movie. You should watch it sometime. Uh, okay. He's also been in How I Met Your Mother, The Shield, a lot of TV shows, Six Feet Under. Um, Argo is another big movie he was in. But that's neither here nor there. So Jackie and Frankie get back in the car. They then go to um, Marky. They find him. He's left the hospital. He's in an intersection. And they get behind him. They shoot him. The car then drifts into the intersection, gets plowed by a, I don't know, another truck or an Another, like, semi-truck, yeah. Yeah. And there's this scene, this slow motion scene of the car. In the rain. In the rain glass everywhere brains coming out of the back it's very poetic in my opinion um i do see this is where i think it ties into the whole killing him softly thing because there is it is a very you would imagine if you were there it's gonna be a very loud and brutal scene but the way it's played out there's like soft music playing in the background it's It's slow very artistic very artistic i agree 100 percent um and then at, at, at which point you know the inevitable happens and jackie kills frankie um, so now you find out he goes, he goes to the bar to meet the lawyer, uh, driver, and you find out that James Gandolfini's character was arrested for a parole, uh, parole violations. Jackie ended up setting that up, thought it'd be better for him to, you know, go and, and get some help. He has the conversation with driver about, you know, everything's taken care of. Uh, driver gives him some money. He goes to the bathroom. He comes back from the bathroom and he had, we had the final scene in the movie where he tells Driver the, the money's short. Driver then basically tells him, you're filling in for so-and-so. So-and-so was only charging 10000 a kill. You killed three people. That's 30000 He says, no, my fee is 15000 per kill. And they have this exchange, at which point uh, Brad Pitt, Jackie, goes into this rendition about how, you know, capitalism, pay me my, pay me my fucking money. The other thing that we didn't mention is that there is these ongoing clips of presidential speeches in the uh, background. That's of the in movie. my notes. I was gonna, I was gonna go there. Go, go for it. Go ahead. No, I, I'm gonna let you do your synopsis, and then I'm gonna go through my notes because <laughs> my notes I went through as the scenes played out. So I may I revisit wait. some of the ones that you did. No, 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 that's um, fine. But I'm gonna let you do it. I'm trying not to interrupt you, but it's, I, it's, you know me, I can't. Oh, no, please, please do. So there's there's three main speeches that happen. I think it is coincidental that it happens with three different presidents. We have a um, Clinton speech in the beginning. There's a George W. No. Oh, no, no. 
very beginning intro scene because I have this is Obama. Obama, as okay, so he's Senator the first. Obama. All right. Then there's a there's a George W. speech, and then a President Obama, or I don't know if he's president yet. It might be like election night or whatever. But there's a, a speech while he was running, at least, and that's mm-hmm. the that's the speech yeah. that's on in the bar when Jackie's talking to Driver, and that's right. kind of what prompts Jackie's little speech. Is he says, you know, Obama's talking about all of us being together. You know, that's that's bullshit. You know, every man for himself. It's capitalism. It's America. Pay me my fucking money. And that's yeah. where the movie ends. I, I do I do have one question. Oh, by the way, the other hitman is dead. Yeah. I'm your new hitman. That's true. Pay yeah, me the my one, money. The one that was charging lower. Um, I do have a question for you. Do you yes. think that he got paid his money? Yes. Yeah, absolutely. There's no way. I you don't I like your hitman. I like Brad Pitt's character in this movie. I think Brad Pitt's a great yes. actor. He has this way of playing a strong, silent, subtle type of type of guy. And he does that very well in this movie. So go ahead. I want to hear your take on the movie. Go ahead. So in general, um, I like the idea of a mafia movie. Um, actually, um, now the name of the movie is escaping me. Uh, Killing himself. Ever. Nope, not this one. Sorry. <laughs> Just kidding. It was another uh, mafia movie that I can't think of. The name of anyways forget that um to me mafia movies and artistic movies maybe don't necessarily go hand in hand and to me that's what this was trying to do and i just don't see them lining up so well like we already broke down the the slow-mo scene of that penultimate kill which was mm-hmm. what he was assigned to do he got hired he got he came in to kill um Marky, which is funny because Marky was innocent. But, right, so uh, he wasn't. He didn't. He wasn't brought in to kill Marky. He was brought sorry. in to figure out who who hit the games. Marky was the obvious starting point. Yes, and from the very beginning, even when Jackie knew that Marky was innocent, Jackie always said Marky's got to die. So well, for me, that 100%. was the major buildup. That, I mean, that was you, the that was the buildup. Do you disagree with that? To me, to uh, me, that was the viable option. Mar- whether whether Marky did it or not, he did the first job. It happened again. People are gonna blame him. We've got to make an example out of him. That that was kind of Jackie's pitch. We got to make an example out of him because yeah. people are gonna blame him. Yeah, I, I guess I get it. Um, but like to me, that was the that was the buildup because since the beginning, since the first time you had Brad Pitt and um, driver. the driver, yeah. So, First time you had them in the car together, he's like, yep, yeah, Marky's got to die. No matter what. Like, that was before he even knew what happened. Yep, Marky's dead. Love so, that, that slow motion scene, uh, you've got Brad Pitt pulls up next to Jackie. Like, mm-hmm. er, nope, I got him mixed up. Jackie Ray, is Ray Brad Pitt. Here. Yeah. Uh, yeah, he Marky. pulls right up to Marky mm-hmm. and shoots him in the side of the head. Like, what? Yep. And then all of a sudden we have this grand slow-mo it was like a Deadpool scene, like the Deadpool mass killing slow mo. That was at least funny. This was meant to be artistic and so like a beautiful scene. And I I'm do, like, what? I want to chime in right there only because I think it's I I think I find it humorous that you said that it was funny. That you found it funny because during the post movie interview at Canon, the director Andrew uh, uh, Andrew Dominic says. This is supposed to be a comedy. No. He says he says this movie is a dark comedy. No. I didn't laugh once in this movie. Uh it was it's dark. It's a dark comedy. Another so Driver, the actor who plays Driver, that is Richard Jenkins, is also in another dark comedy with Brad Pitt, um, Burn After Reading. Thought that was kind of funny. Defat Comics is the publishing branch of Don'tForgetATowel.com, the only place to travel geekly. Focusing on creator-owned and independent titles like Hollowed, Pursuit of Plastic, and Fairy, and many more. Defat Comics will be a mix of genres appealing to every kind of reader. Join the new source of comic book entertainment with Defat Comics.
I also one of the, one of the other things that was pointed out to me that I didn't realize until after the fact is so you you have these two sides, okay? You have the criminal side with the um, uh, Frankie and Russell criminal. Girl. True, but you have okay. So you have the you have the criminal of the criminals, and then you have the mafia side with Jackie and Driver. Uh, both sides have a character that is purely designed as a pleasure-seeking character. So the mafia side, you have James Gandolfini's character, who's all about yeah. uh, drinking and everything. And on the uh, criminal Russell. side, Russell. I thought that was an interesting balance that both sides, both sides have a character whose pleasure-seeking drive gets them into trouble and ultimately is their demise. And both are kind of crazy. Yeah, yeah. The uh, the the other thing that that uh, Andrew Dominic said was uh, the most dramatic expression of drama is violence, and I I'll thought that that. Was, that was pretty poetic. He uh, he got a lot of criticism for the amount of violence he put in this movie, which it's I, a mafia movie. I not, expect that a hundred percent. I don't think. I mean, there was the scene with Ray Liotta's death is somewhat graphic. There's some blood, you know, and the broken glass, and, but. It and, and I'll say, I think Squirrel's death was a little graphic only because of the blood yeah. and everything. But even those, I don't think were overly graphic. And other than those two, there really weren't any other major graphic scenes. So the I don't only know... other one that I can think of is when they are kicking the shit out of Ray Liotta outside of his car. They 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 get him really good to the point where, I mean, it was just supposed to be like rough him up a little bit. And then... Um, Marky actually like throws up on the guy's shoes or something. Yeah, gets his shoes dirty. The so the guy like kick like knocks him out. Like he's got blood everywhere. Like that was a little. I mean, comparatively to the guy being shot in the head with a shotgun, uh, maybe not so much. But that one was more of a extended. Um, I can't think of my words today. Uh. Your like extended exposure to the the violence and the gore, I guess. Yeah, I, I um, agree with that. When, when I, asked, go ahead. No, go ahead. I I was just gonna start <laughs> at the top, so have at it. <laughs> when when asked why he picked this movie to produce, Brad Pitt said that uh, he likes stories that say something about our time and who we are, specifically when referencing the economic crisis, which. Yep. I'm just I'm just sprinkling that in there because I will come back to that and that's that's going to be the hook right there. I can't I can't wait. Go ahead. Well, so this is all supposed to take place during the economic crisis and it's brought up that, you know, even the mafia was affected by the economic crisis. That was stated very early on in the movie. Um but really I think I just need to kind of go down the line of these crazy scenes that I have written down. Some of these are the reason that this movie kind of just turned me off. Okay. So the intro. The right very, from the beginning. Intro. The very, <laughs> very first scene of this movie. I'm. So this is what happened. I turned the movie on in my living room, turned it on, walked into the kitchen, grabbed something to drink, and I'm like, is there a trailer on before this or something? Which I watched this on Netflix, and I was like, that seems odd. Why is Obama talking? <laughs> He's in this movie? <laughs> I was like, is there like some new documentary I don't know about? Like, what's happening? So I come around the corner and I was like, oh no, this is the movie. It's like flashing, killing them softly with a black background. I was like, oh, okay, well, nope, we're just diving right in. And then all of a sudden we see like a tunnel and all you can see, it's like a dark tunnel and then you see light on the outside and on the outside of the tunnel is just like garbage and plastic bags blowing all over the place. And I'm like, I really hope they cleaned all that up. Um, <laughs> <laughs> because I'm already like not into this movie yet. I'm like, that seems like maybe we should clean that up when we leave. No, no uh, bags were harmed in the making of this movie. Right. Um, but so... Uh, I actually wrote down here that I wanted to research what speech, um, but I didn't. But it was one of Obama's speeches uh, as a senator. Um, I just found it really odd. And the whole scene is um, 
Frankie is going is walking down the street to go meet Russell for the first time. Like that's where you meet right. them. And I'm like, and he is walking his dog. So dramatic. It's not even his dog. It's, it's dog not even dog. his. You you find <laughs> that out. Yeah, that's his gimmick. But yeah. But so we meet Russell for the first time, and I'm looking at him, and I'm like, okay, Frankie's in like a denim jacket with like sheepskin collar. I'm like, okay, yeah, so it's typical denim winter jacket i think yeah yeah so i'm like okay it's winter and then all of a sudden we meet russell and he is dripping sweat. <laughs> he is dirty and sweaty during this entire movie yeah i'm like well, okay is he like cracked out of his mind did he just sprint here like what's happening i i think that was a conscious decision i think it was a conscious it decision to, to make be. yeah his character is meant to you, you get the impression just off a of physical appearance, like you said, that his character is not only a criminal, but a step below um, Frankie. Like he's just, he's dirty. He's, he's probably on something. Oh, he's definitely on something. Cause there's another scene later on. We'll get to that one. <laughs> um, your, your disdain for this movie is just great. I literally wrote why so sweaty. <laughs> Australian guy. Why so sweaty? Um, so there's a scene where I believe it's when Frankie and Russell are driving to are are they driving to actually hold up the card game or they're on their way to go see Squirrel? Something. They're in the car together and they're talking up uh, Russell's talking about his girl being crazy. Mm-hmm. And I don't remember the whole thing, but I just remember what the hell he's the crazy like he's nuts. This I can't I can't even remember the whole scene besides just him going on this like ten minute rant about this crazy girl he used to see. Can I can I tell you one of my favorite parts of the movie? Please do. They, Is it that one? The it's crazy not girl. That one. <laughs> Ru- Russell and Frankie are in the car going to rob the uh, the card game and russell has brought gloves for them to use during the game <laughs> yeah. they are dish gloves like dish the long gloves. rubber like toilet cleaning Bright gloves. yellow it's the I, I i laugh so hard during that because he's like what what did you couldn't get regular gr- gloves because it's all she had awesome who, who had them probably his girlfriend i would assume i think that's when they that's started talking about that yeah um and then i had a note that uh, he went to go pick up Jackie uh, when Driver was going to pick up Jackie and there was another voiceover and that one was the one with uh, President Bush. Mm-hmm. And at that point in time, anytime there was one of those voiceovers, it just kind of took me out of what was happening. So, um, so that is a lot of criticism that, that uh, Andrew Dominic received was that the movie was too political. Um, what his, his rebuttal to that was that he felt the movie was not a political movie, but it was one step away from a political movie so that it was something that you could talk about, but it didn't have to be something that was the sole focus of the movie. And I I think he did a pretty decent job of that. I mean, if you don't like politics or you don't want it in your movie, then that's obviously going to turn you off, which evidently it did. But I do like the idea that he put it. So like it's a topic, but it doesn't have to be in the forefront. To me, it was still too much. Um, Basically, to me, every transition in that movie had some sort of speech or some sort of, like, there was some sort of voiceover that was a political figure talking. And I won't lie to you, I tuned most of it out because I was still, like, the first few that I listened to took me so much out of the movie that I had to, like, refocus when things started happening again. So... Later on in the movie, I was just like, okay, like, don't, don't pay attention. Like, what's happening in this scene? Like, there's a car drive, like, stupid things. Right. Like, this is, it's too distracting for me. And um, there were scenes, um, I think it was when Frankie and Jackie were at the bar. You can see uh, Obama in the background during, like, one of his debates or something. So I was like, okay, like, you can't hear it, but you can see it. Mm-hmm. And... Like, you're drawing me back to more politics. Like, I get it. Um, So I feel like there may have been other ways. Like, show me some articles or, like, show me me some 
news so, headings or something like that. Um, maybe there were some, and I just, again, was trying to ignore them so much. There were is there? so so many subtle things that were done in this movie that drive home the point of capitalism. I mean, that, that's ultimately the point of the movie. The point yeah, of the oh, movie yeah, totally. Totally. Is to talk about money and capitalism and and the the economic depression we were in, um, the the whole debate of of getting a hitman essentially at a discounted rate. He has uh, James Gandolfini's character fly in coach, the dish gloves, the sawed off shotgun. You you have just the, the debate with the money at the end, the debate with the prostitute over the tip. I mean, they just keep driving home this point. There's is the songs that are played in the background all play into the deeper meaning. There's a song called This Town is Nervous that plays in uh, when they're talking about all the casino games shutting down. The fact that the main motivation of the movie is for the mafia to get the casino games up and running again because they're missing out on money. Um, There is a line in the movie that I specifically wrote down. I wrote down one quote, and it was Jackie at the end of the movie, and he said, America is not a country, it's a business. And that stuck with me. 100%. 100%. Uh, Andrew Dominic in the in the press conference afterwards has a, an amazing quote that I am going to put in my quote book someday. Capitalism is Darwin's theory of evolution applied to finance. I, I mean, I was like, that's amazing. Yeah. That's amazing. And it, here's, it, here's why this underlying message turned the movie for me. Because when I first watched it, I got the speeches in the background. I got the the speech at the end by by Jackie about economics and you know pay me my fucking money and all that all that stuff. But at the end of the day, I kind of saw the movie as okay, two guys rob a game, they get found out, they get killed, movie's over. It's very straight line. There's not much to it. That's kind of why I didn't like it. And then the more I read about it, and I and I, they started pointing out these subtleties throughout the movie that were driving home the point of capitalism and how you know, money makes the world go around. And I was like, that's to me, it was in the forefront of the movie, but it was still so subtle that I didn't pick up on all the nuances. And once I did after the fact, that's kind of why I started. I don't want to, again, I'm not saying, I'm not trying to claim it's a good movie. I'm just Mm -hmm. saying that I liked the hidden meanings that escaped me the first time around. So what you are explaining is a perfect movie to me. A movie that I can sit and watch and just get, if I'm if I'm watching and I am not thinking about this movie, I'm not picking it apart while I'm watching it, and I enjoy it, perfect movie. Well, good movie, excuse me. Perfect movie is now, I can either go back and rewatch this, or I decide to watch some interviews or do some research or anything like that. Mm-hmm. And I realized that there is just so much more to the movie that I missed. So that makes me, okay, now I need to go back and rewatch this movie. And uh, I don't feel like they were subtle enough in this movie. Like, I, I really think that the transitions with all of the voiceovers just smacked me so hard in the face. I couldn't get over that. And to me, that made the movie very choppy. Mm-hmm. It didn't flow nicely. It was, the story was just kind of lackluster. And to me, that is why I think I didn't like the movie so much. Now, all of the things that point to capitalism, all of these little hidden clues, all of these little, these little nuggets that you're pointing out are things that would really intrigue me and really like suck me into the movie. To make me watch it a second time, but I don't think I could do it. Like I, because <laughs> no, it just was too much. They they weren't subtle enough for me. Like, right. I, I, and I guess that's that's a fine line of how do you make them subtle enough that it's like a hidden gem, right? But not too subtle that everybody misses it. And I think a hundred percent. I mean, that's. <laughs> There's no, there's, you got to do a perfect or like you got to find the the perfect balance and that's got that's so tough and right. i just feel like it was over the top for me on I, this one 100 percent, i couldn't agree more i think i i think that's that's why i have so much respect for some of these directors that we have nowadays um i shouldn't say nowadays i mean some some of the greatest directors ever because you do have to have this this message that is both hidden so that it's not slapping you in the face 
but also not too hidden where people feel a sense of accomplishment by finding it. You know, mm-hmm. you don't, you don't want it to bypass them. You want them to find it and go, Ooh, I don't think, I don't think other people would have seen that. I don't think you know that that's something that I could have lost. And it's funny that you bring that up because uh, Ray Liotta was talking when, you know, all this debate about the bigger message and, and all this subtlety and stuff were coming out. Ray Liotta said uh, w- w- about his take on the movie. I, I just like to play pretend. He said, I'm not here. I, I, it sounds like a lot of work setting all this up. I'm just here to serve at the director's behest. I'm just his tool to tell his story. And I think that you, when you look at Ray Liotta and Brad Pitt's take on this movie, you have two completely different actors take. You have Ray Liotta, who's I'm here as your tool to tell your story. And you have Brad Pitt, who's actively producing the movie and wants a a say in how it's played out. Now, maybe it's a little different because he's the producer, but I, I do think you, you have, it's interesting to me the two different types of acting approaches that, that people can have. Do you think that the movie would have been any different if both had the same style? Not necessarily the same style, but like, okay, Ray Liotta, I'm here to act. I'm, I'm just here to act out the story. The writer puts in all those little things. Mm-hmm. Whereas... Brad Pitt is, yeah, he's there to act, but he's also, like you said, he's involved in maybe putting in these little tidbits as well. Um, That's an interesting... Like, do you think the dynamic of the movie would have changed if... Oh, certainly. Of course. If Brad Pitt was just like, nope, I'm just here to play what's on the page, or if Ray Liotta was like, hey, uh, maybe... Yeah, I I don't know, and just threw some stuff in there. There's no question to me that the movie would have changed. It's just a matter of how much. You know, I mean, how much of this story was Brad Pitt responsible for? Uh, he's not credited as being a writer on the movie, but he obviously was a producer. Um, he did fund the movie, you know, from that aspect. So I think the movie would have been different. I think that what makes a good movie is having that, you know, it's the ingredients. You know, it's like it's like anything else. Right. It's having the right combination of different flavors so that the outcome is the cake and not, you know, a burned piece of junk like I would make. So you don't think it really would have pushed it up to a better par movie, really? No, I think I think the issue to you know what let let's let's let me pencil that for a second or shelve that for a second. I do um you are not a listener of the podcast yet because obviously nothing's been released. You're my my third <laughs> guest. Uh Third with an asterisk. My my second guest, um, his his uh, a podcast probably won't get released. Um, I'm oh. very picky. I'm very picky. This is going well though. Anyway, so one <laughs> of the one of <laughs> one of the things I like to do is I have five standard questions that I'm going to be asking every one of my guests based on the movie that we watched. Um, are you ready? I have a question. Ready to play? I have a question for you too. Go ahead. Yeah. You want to go first? Well, I don't know if my question my question was just, do you think watching this a second time would affect how you feel about this movie because you went and you did all of this research Mm -hmm. how does that affect how you would view this movie great question especially with all of those hidden nuggets and all of those references that now you're looking for yeah great great question um the the short answer is yes but that would be my answer to any movie. I'm a strong believer and actually just had this debate with a friend of mine, Alec on, on one of the other podcasts was uh, I asked him, you know, we were talking about his top, his top movies. And I said, how many times do you think you've seen some of your top movies? And he's like, Oh, in the twenties, thirties, you know? And I said, honestly, I can count probably on two hands, how many movies I've seen more than three times. Like I'm a firm believer that part of what makes a good movie and a good movie experience is seeing it with the fresh set of eyes. I think there definitely are movies that I have a better appreciation for the second and third time I watch them. Um, prime example for me would be 2001 Space Odyssey. That movie was atrocious the first time I watched it. But the more research I did about it, um, not just the movie with the books and everything, the more I appreciated the movie and the more I, I, I enjoyed it as I watched it again and again and again. But with that being said, that to me, that's the abnormality. I think part of a good movie is that fresh set of eyes and seeing things for the first time. And like we were talking about, picking up on those subtleties the director has put in there. 
and knowing they're there is like having the cheat codes to the game. You can still have fun playing it, but it's not the same. Right. Um, so, so to answer your question, yes, I do think I would appreciate the movie a little bit more, but I don't think I would be seeing it the same way that it's meant to be seen, you know, with those fresh set of eyes. So I guess I really wanted to know if, would you want to see it again? But this to me is making you, or that answer really just tells me like most movies you don't necessarily want to see again. Like I'll agree with you in the fact that uh, to me, the first time I see a movie is, is like the make it or break it. I, I don't rewatch movies that I don't like. Like if I did not like it, I'm not giving you another shot. And we had this discussion on another podcast about what was a movie that after you watched it so many times, you finally liked it. And I I had such a hard time coming up with an answer because I just don't give it that extra opportunity. However, you ask me how many times I've seen movies that I do enjoy. I will rewatch them over and over and over again. And that's to me, what makes it a good movie is that I can continue to do that. Um, Now, if I enjoyed the movie in any sense of the meaning and then did some research on it, which I must have enjoyed it to do some research on, there are movies that I'll go back and rewatch just to be just to see and like pick up on that in the Mm -hmm. moment. Um, So to me, all the research you did, having heard bits and pieces of it sound awesome. I still don't want to see this movie again. I'm 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 with you. I, like I said, I don't think the movie's good, but I definitely appreciate it more. I mean, the, my my go to example is like you're not watching The Sixth Sense again with the same awe you did the first time. You're not watching Correct. Memento again with the same awe. You know those. And granted, those are like the twist ending movies, which of course you're not going to. But even some of the basic ones, um, you just you're not you're not enjoying it for the first time. You can't tell me that you watch Sucker Punch. Um, now and it has that same kind of surprise and awe. I mean that that movie is there's not visually... really surprise and awe to be had in that movie, but uh, yes, agreed. I I, I love that, that movie is visually very appealing. And I'm I'm not even just talking about the obvious things. I'm just saying like the <laughs> the, the scenes in that movie are just shot yeah. very well. And uh, you know you watch them again, and yeah, they still look nice, but it's not the same. It's not the you know the fresh set of eyes. Take a movie like Knives Out. I won't go into it. But, you can. You like, can. It's on Amazon Prime. I watched it. Oh, we should have done that movie. Um, we should, anyway, we um, I will rewatch that movie. I haven't yet. I will rewatch that movie. But you're not going to have the same reaction because you now know the twist. Right. Which So something similar to that. That that movie was good. Oh, my God. I loved it. It was a step short of great. And the reason we why. To, we need to was, have conversation a whole conversation about whole it I just, conversation. <laughs> it was it was mildly predictable that's all 100 yes very much so and they told you what was going to happen before it happened so yes but right sidebar okay so here are the five questions uh question number one and we can take as much time as we want on these uh no rush are you are you asking all of them or am i going to do like one at a time i'm gonna i'm gonna add one at a time okay perfect uh, question number one, what aspect of the storytelling was done right? What aspect was done wrong? And who gets the credit? So writer, director, actor. We'll go with, we'll go with done right first. What aspects of the storytelling were done right? So when you ask that question, my immediate response is like, uh, my brain's thinking of what scenes did I like the most? Um, and to me, the scenes where Jackie and Driver are in the car together and having conversations together, those to me, I think, were uh, probably the most informative scenes, except mm-hmm. for, like, hey, I'm killing you and stuff like that. That's, that's informative. But, uh, like, you're getting so many behind-the-scenes details, and you're getting a lot of those... Uh, kernels of the capitalism and stuff like that and so I think those parts were told really well and because I also got their underlying meaning I think who do you um, give the credit for for that 
Like, I mean, do you? I mean, you the, think... the, obviously, the writer gave those words, but uh, I don't. I, I agree with you. I think those I scenes know. are done very well. Driver is never once seen in the movie standing up. He's always nope. either in the car or, or He's sitting in the car at the bar. or at the. Yep. Um, I oh, I think. The, oh, he was at the bar. Yeah. Yep, okay. I think both of those actors are do an amazing job, and I have to give the credit to the actors for that. To be able to, I mean, you can put words on paper, but to be able to pull those conversations off, it's it's yeah. two guys talking in a car. In a and car, and somehow... to say that those are my favorite scenes in a movie, yeah. Like now that I think about it, yeah, you're definitely right. You're right. So what <laughs> what aspects were done wrong? <laughs> Everything else. <laughs> yeah, we didn't even get to like my least favorite scene. Go ahead. Um my least favorite scene was probably when Russell, who was the super sweaty Australian, as I like to refer to him, um shoots up. It, he it's like heroin or something and he gets yeah. ridiculously high and then now you're on this weird trip with him. Well, Frankie is trying to have a conversation with him. So he's going in and out of tripping, but also like in and out of consciousness. Right. And it's just, I can't, I, I don't know if it's just me in the way I can't focus on one thing at a time, but you're jumping around so fast. You, you lost me. So this is a But they were after... also trying to be, they were also trying to be artistic about it at the same time. So I'm like, you're, you're trying to be artsy and fancy, but. You're jumping everywhere, and I I can't I can't do it. This is immediately after they rob the card game. Uh, the presumption is that they're using some of that money to go buy drugs. I, it's got to be heroin because they were definitely shooting up. Yep. Um, no, I'm with you. I think I think the point of that scene was to play on how you know low level these two guys are, but but I'm with you on that. But here's my my mind also takes me out of it because it must be right after, but it's also n- not. Because Russell has already done his trip to Florida. This is when Russell is going over his whole You're Florida right. trip, how he drives all of these dogs with his partner down in this one vehicle, and they cut over to the vehicle so you can see it, and there's dog shit everywhere. <laughs> like, all over was, the windows. It was raining, so they couldn't they couldn't open the windows, and all the dogs were shitting and puking and stuff, yeah. And yeah. That, so this is where he tells Frankie, you know, that he told the other that guy. That he told the other guy. Yep. Right. Yeah, and you're right. this other guy works for Jackie. So Jackie's like, what idiots. Right, but, yeah. But yeah, so that, that, that scene was done terribly. <laughs> along with every cutscene transition. Nope. And so who do you give credit for for that? For sucking? Um... I'm gonna say that was directors. <laughs> have you have you seen um, the assassination of Jesse James? No. Neither have I. Okay. We should we should check that out? I've heard good things. Okay. Um, okay. Question number two: What is the biggest unanswered question of the movie for you? And do you think this was done intentionally? Um, I thought I had a question that I wrote down on here, but. Oh, biggest unanswered question about this movie is who was Mickey hired to kill? Because Mickey didn't do anything. You don't that's, see Mickey kill anybody. Right. So who is James, he supposed to kill? I think he was brought in to kill the this is James Gandolfini's character, who is the depressed, drunk, washed up <laughs> assassin. Who was he supposed to kill? Because it I was, think the, it was the, reason he, the reason he was brought in was because Jackie, Brad Pitt's character, has already had dealings with him, so he'd be recognized. So, Brad Pitt ends up killing Squirrel, mm-hmm. Jackie, or not Jackie, sorry, Squirrel, Frankie, and Marky. That's the three kills. Correct. That's all three kills. So, so he, he brings... Uh, he brings Mickey in to kill somebody because there was only three kills that were supposed to happen. Right. Mickey doesn't kill anyone. Correct. Who was he supposed to kill? 
That you're, do, you, do you think that question was done intentionally? No, I think they had shitty writing. <laughs> I think so too. Okay, question number three. Uh, personal connection is important. Was there anything that happened in the movie that reminded you of a real life story that happened to you? No. <laughs> I mean, it doesn't have to be a direct tie. It's not like, oh, I remember the time <laughs> I was hired to kill somebody. I ended up sleeping with a hooker and getting arrested. It's just more yeah. like, oh, this scene reminded me of, of you know, something else. Hmm. So. No. I can't even. As to, like, I hate having no as an answer to a question, but I can't. No. Nope. <laughs> nope. I, I think I would have to be emotionally invested in this movie in order to create ties to it and i just was not <laughs> you're not that's maybe that's the issue maybe the director couldn't couldn't create those ties enough yeah sorry what is the most important sequence in the movie the most important sequence i'd say probably when jackie starts what I say the the heist itself, when they go in and they actually start, they you see um, Frankie and Russell in their car beforehand. That's when he brings out the the dishwashing gloves and the super sawed off shotgun, um, and then you see him put like the tightest pantyhose over his head. <laughs> was it just me, or like when he put it on his head, it looked like it like he wasn't going to be able to put it over his face. I, uh, no, I I agree. And I also agree that that was the most important sequence. I mean, not only does it set up the movie, obviously, because it's the yeah, heist. It's the whole point. But it really but, is, you know, it, it plays into the stupidity of these two guys. And you almost think like one of the one of the things I, I did like about that scene, you you're you're holding your breath that whole time. I mean, you you're like, are they going to are they going to pull this off? Are they really going to like because you have this room waiting, full of go ahead. I was no, waiting, I was waiting for Russell to talk because he has a very blatant accent. So I was like, I'm waiting for Russell to talk. So that way later on, even though you're wearing a mask, somebody's going to know it's you because who else sounds like you? He doesn't. So I'm like, wow, bravo. You were smart enough not to talk, but uh, like he just, the whole scene, he's like pointing with his, his remainder of a shotgun and like flinging his head around and you see sweat going everywhere. (laughs) I was waiting for Marky to pull out a gun, like out of the safe or something or one of the guys at the table to pull out a gun. So when Marky reached in the safe or like went, when he crouched down, I did think he was going to pull out a gun. Um, and when, they weren't really paying attention to him at that point. That's like, um, at that point in time, I think Frankie was, was Frankie the one who had Marky at gunpoint or was it? Russell? No, that was Russell. Russell had Mark cause Frankie watched Frankie everybody else. The other. Yep. So Russell at one point in time, when, um, when, uh, Marky does like bend down to go to the, the safe, they specifically show Russell looking out and kind of checking in with Frankie. Right. And they're both really anxious at this point. And that's when I thought, like, oh, he's distracted. But then he would have no movie because then they would have failed. Right. Unless it was just trying to figure out who attempted the heist or who hi- who planned it. But I'd say, yeah, the, the heist is definitely the most important part because it sets up the whole movie. Um, it, it gives you an inside look at these characters individually you get to see russell you get to see frankie you get to see uh marky even um i mean and then it obviously brings in jackie brad pitt's assassin so all right my last question if you could recast two roles in the film what roles would they be and who would you recast in them and why I think I'd recast Frankie. Um and Squirrel. Okay. Who would you um, who you put in those roles? So oh. Frankie is played by Scoop McNary. Um 
Frankie being one of the, I'd say main characters of the movie, he is one of the two actually performing the heist, um, and probably gets some of the most screen time. I don't really know Scoot McNair, Mary, Scoot McNair. Um, so it wasn't really, he, he kind of just blended in. Right. He was kind of uh, washed out by like Brad Pitt and James Gandolfini. Like you have these bigger names um, and more well-known actors. So I would have put somebody, I don't know that you can put somebody more well-known in this small budget film. Um, who could I put in as a somewhat neurotic heist? Ooh. Christian Bale. Know. Sure. I'll go with it. When, I mean, Why if not? you see him in, uh, what was the boxing movie he was in? Where he plays the brother, like the cracked out brother? Yep. Oh, it's going to kill me. I know that. All right, who's your who's your second one? Um, I would cast Squirrel, who is Squirrel is the mastermind behind the whole heist. He doesn't get a lot of screen time. Either it's when they're discussing the heist, or when he's being killed. And the fighter, Christian Bale's in the fighter. Sorry. The fighter. <laughs> uh, let's put John Malkovich in here just to make it crazy i could see i could also see him playing the lawyer yes but i think richard jenkins did well i wouldn't recast him i think he again i think he's probably uh because of those scenes being my favorite scenes in the movie i think i leave him alone but yeah uh bring in james malkovich if you want this to be a comedy i think he's going to give you some comedic aspects i also think he can give you more of a a little bit crazy. I think it, it, he plays crazy really well. Mm-hmm. Um, I think that Squirrel in the movie was put together. I mean, you gotta be a little crazy to take such a risk to to rob a mob poker game, a mafia right. poker game. So I think that if they played him a little bit more wacky, or a little bit more, even a little bit more, like, uh, neurotic or something like that. I think that could have put a different twist on the character. Not that it needed it, but you forced me to. So, that's what I would do. All right. Um, so, this movie comes out in theaters November uh, of 2012. Uh, premieres at Canon in May. Comes out in November. It had a budget of $15 million. It makes just over that uh, domestically, goes on to do another $22 million internationally for a total of $37.9 million. So it made its money back, almost uh, more than double. Mm-hmm. Uh, what, uh, what other movies came out that week? You want to take some guesses? It, pre- it premieres at number six on the box office that, that uh, day. It, wait, what? Try yeah, that again. It, it, it hits number six. The day it's released, it's number six for gross. Um, uh, Weinstein Company is the distributor. Although, FYI, James Gandolfini threatened to punch Harvey Weinstein in the face during this movie. Apparently, <laughs> it is very well known that James Gandolfini is not um, somebody who likes to promote his stuff. Okay. Which, which, once I read that, I was like, that makes sense. I don't think I've ever seen him do any talk shows or anything. But uh, Weinstein himself oh. was trying to get uh, Gandolfini to do Letterman to promote Killing Him Softly. And I guess he was calling him over and over and over again on set uh, to get him to sign on to do this. And Gandolfini told one of the guys on set, if if he calls me one more time, I'm going to beat the shit out of him. So I thought that was kind of funny. Um, anyway, so don't look it up. What uh, Can you give me any other movies that premiered that uh, you what? think? It was... 2012. 2012. The number one movie is a sequel, um, kind of a teen teen type movie. It's been out for 15 days at this point. Is it a Twilight or Hunger Games? Twilight Breaking Dawn Part 2. There we go. Um, what else 
came out around that time. Oh no, I moved my movies. I got a new movie shelf, so Ooh. in other podcasts, you may or may not see me look in that direction a lot. To reference? Because I'm scanning my movies to like get an idea. Um, November. So there's got to be some sort of kid movie out because it's holiday. Very good. Number number five is a kid's movie. Well, number five and number eight are both kid's movies. Eight is definitely far more kid's movie than, than five, I think. Is it five and eight? Five and eight are both kids' movies. Number two is also a sequel, but I would say this is this is not the second. This is like way farther down the list than, than number two. Um very well known character. It's been out for twenty two days at this point. Sony's Sony Pictures releases it. Okay, so Sony is Spider-Man or what else does Sony do? There I'm trying to, there are there are no Marvel movies on this list. Not in the top ten. I'm only I'm only caring about the top ten. What else does Sony do besides Spider Man? This before huh? Spider Skyfall, number two. All right. Number three okay. is a You're giving movie. good clues here. <laughs> number three is a movie that uh, you probably haven't seen. It's long. It's good. Uh, the lead actor in the movie is very well known for being a method actor. He got a lot of flack for the voice he used for this Jared character. Leto? Not Jared Leto. Uh, method actor. Who else is a method actor that people get mad at? He oh, gets... I don't he gets like really into his characters and almost obscenely so. Uh, I'm metal loss here. That would be. Gonna... You want me to go the actor? Leo? Not Leo. Uh, I got nothing. Uh, Daniel Day Lewis. Oh, okay. What was he in? Um,. I'm just trying to think of what he was in recently. Movie's Lincoln. very presidential. Lincoln. Lincoln. Yep. Number three. Number four is a movie that I believe would go on Wait, to Wait, did win. we do one? Yes, Twilight. Oh, d- number one was Twilight. Number two was? Number two was Skyfall. Okay. Th- three, three is Lincoln. Lincoln. Four is what we're doing now. Yeah, four is a movie... It goes on to win several awards. It's kind of an obscure movie. Um, it's the main... You probably haven't heard of a single actor in it. Uh, it's One of its main stars is an animal. It's, I don't know what else I can say without giving it away. It largely takes place on a boat... I don't Is think it a you're gonna real get animal. Um, yeah, I believe a, a real animal was used in a lot of the scenes in this movie. Although I'm sure there's probably some CGI. I'm like scrolling through the IMDb page to see if there's anything on here. There's not. It is Life of Pi. Have you oh. seen that? No, I have not. Got a lot of got a lot of awards. Um, number five is the is a kids movie. Uh, at least I think it was intended to be a kids movie. It's put out by DreamWorks. Um, one of the, probably one of the last no, probably one of the last films DreamWorks did. I think this was meant to be the start of a franchise. Uh, I believe it's based on a book, but I don't think it didn't do very well. Although I liked it personally. Let me make sure I'm thinking of the same the right movie. DreamWorks, not the Crudes. That was later. So tw- I'm trying to think. 2012, I was still at the vid. <sighs> Not Disney, so get rid of all those. This is an animated movie. Oh, that's so usually you say kids. I, I automatically thought animated. Okay. Um, and it was a book. 
I, I believe and you so. I think it was supposed to start a franchise. Oh, you know what? I'm actually thinking of the wrong movie. I'm thinking of the wrong movie. This movie was Ixnay all that. This movie <laughs> is based on holidays. You definitely haven't seen this movie. Rise of the Guardians. I have seen that movie. Isn't this, that the one with Jack Frost? Yeah, it's good. Yep, yep, exactly. Legends Unite. Got the Easter Bunny in it. I thought, what's the movie with the owls? Court of Owls? No, isn't that like a Guardians <laughs> movie? I don't know. Irrelevant, I guess. And then obviously number six is Killing Him Softly. Number seven is a remake. Um, the original movie starred Patrick Swayze. One of his first movies he ever did. He was like a like a teen, late or early 20s in the movie. The Foley. remake did horribly. Is it Foley? It is not. It is Red Dawn. Oh, okay. So, interesting story about either. that. The original movie, Red Dawn, I thought was a comedy. So, have you ever... Do you know what it's about? No, but I don't think it's anywhere near a comedy. So, I thought it was a comedy. Um, and I was. I ended up getting really high and watching it. Come to find out, it's about uh, the Russian invasion of the U.S. And it's the dawn of World War Three. Yeah, not in a fun movie. In Midwestern America, no. <laughs> not a fun movie to watch when you're when you're not in the right state of mind. Uh, number eight is the kids' movie Walt Disney Studios. Huge movie. Uh, it's made a sequel after this. It's probably going to make a third one. Um very well known based around video games. Wreck it Ralph. Wreck it Ralph. Number nine is a movie I've never heard of called Flight. That's love... one with Denzel. Is that is that the, the Denzel one? I thought that was like I don't know, Airline 47 or Maybe. something. Maybe. I could be wrong. Okay, one other game I enjoy playing. Uh as you may or may not know, um Rotten Tomatoes has two oh. scores. The first one is usually the critic score, and the second one is the audience score. Um, this game is called Guess That Tomato, okay. where you are going to try to guess the audience score for Killing Them Softly. Once you are done guessing, I'm going to give you a couple movies that are within 2% of this movie and allow you to adjust your answer if you'd like. So go ahead, Lauren. Guess That Tomato. And I'm guessing both, or just one. You're guessing just the audience score. Just the audience score, okay. Apparently, I pay attention to direction very well. <laughs> audience score, 53%. Okay. Other <laughs> movies that are within 2% of this movie, uh, Girl on the Train. Do you remember that one? I haven't seen it, but yes, I wanted to see that one. She's one of my favorite actresses. I don't, I don't remember her name, but she's one of my favorite actresses. Uh, uh, Pacific... That would be, uh, that would be Mrs. John Krasinski, is it not? Yes, Mrs. Mary Poppins. Although I can't think of her name. Um, Ghost <laughs> in the Shell. It would be Emily Blunt, by the way. Emily Blunt. God, she's amazing. Um, G- Ghost in the Shell, Pacific Rim Which Uprising. Didn't do well. Neither of those really did well, did they? Murder Mystery. That didn't do well. And Red Sparrow. None of those did well at all. Watch Red Sparrow. Very good movie. I want to watch. Red Sparrow is what, well, watching the trailer for Red Sparrow, that's like what I wanted uh, Black Widow to be. So Yeah, Red Sparrow has a very, some very crazy scenes. All right. I do want to see that movie still. Um. I'll have to see if it's on anything. Anyways, um... Do you so, want to adjust your tomato score? You said, what, 53, I think? Is that, is that your answer? Yeah. Um, do I want to adjust my tomato score? See, I feel like Murder Mystery did terrible. Red Sparrow didn't do so hot either. I can't remember what the other ones were now. Um, let's go with, I'll give it a 57. 
So all those movies are within Did I go the wrong two, way? Are within two points of a forty-four. Oh. Forty-four. Killing himself, I got a forty-four on Rotten Tomatoes. A lot of not happy uh viewers. One person said the trailer for the film looks good, but the film itself disappoints. The filmmaker tried to copy the style of Tarantino and the Coen brothers, but it does not work here. What was the uh, director, or not the directors, what was the um, critic score? It's good question. 73. Really? Yes. So, I mean, I would, I would say more often than not, the critic score and the audience score are not usually very close unless they're both high. If they're both True. high, then they match, obviously. But uh, usually if one drops, the other one doesn't. Wow. Well, I this would... has been a pleasure. Any, any other final thoughts on killing him softly? Um, nope. Don't get any presidential voiceovers. <laughs> Uh, we do want to end this podcast with the same way we end every podcast, as you well know, at DFAT, which is what are you geeking out on? Um, it's a little tough because me and you go over what we're geeking out on pretty much every week. But right. uh, anything new? Anything new that you're enjoying? I just made sure this morning that The Last of Us, the remastered edition, is downloaded on my PlayStation because I am one of those people that if a sequel comes out, I have to replay the games before it. Ooh. That's so a long I, game, isn't it? It is a long game, but it is one that Dana and I both really enjoyed, and it was one that she would beg me to play. So Very, very am, movie-esque. Yes. Um, so I am totally down to play that. I haven't even picked up my copy of the second one yet because I knew I was going to do this. So then I will also be geeking out on The Last of Us Part Two when that happens as well. Um, so it's not just movies that I like that I keep watching over and over again. It's video games that I like. I will replay. It is books that I will reread. It's books that I will listen to again. It's if I find something and you catch my attention enough, like to me, that is what makes it so good is I can play it again. I can watch it again. I can listen to it again. Even if I know exactly what's around every corner, I'm still interested enough to give you more of my time. And to me, that's a success. success. So. Well, you heard it here, creators. Get on that. Lauren enjoys it. Please, me. Thanks again. Um, this is Bob and my special guest, Lauren. Thanks for tuning in to Gutsy Media Podcast. See you later. We're not going to do that. We're not going to do that. I didn't prepare. <laughs> no, I'm no, not... I was kidding. That is uh, the wedding I was in. That is the um, the extra champagne we had. Oh, nice. I have an interesting champagne story, actually. Uh, Tell me. When I was in the military, we had to do a working party for the Marine Corps birthday where we went to the Capitol building. Okay. And we they put us in some random room which was gorgeous. I mean, the Capitol building's how old? It was a gorgeous room. It was big cathedral ceilings and everything, but it was like a like no use room. And they set up all these appetizers and drinks and stuff like that for the Marine Corps birthday. And the idea was that senators and congressmen could come in the room during the day and and pig out and then like celebrate the Marine Corps birthday. Uh, well, okay. come one o'clock, we had like three people total. So they were like, listen, we're just going to pack up all the leftover food and drinks you guys can take with you like as a thank you. We're like, sweet. Sweet. So we went back to the barracks, and I had like four bottles of champagne unopened. I ended up getting drunk off the champagne. Because That's a like, bad hangover. Oh, my God. It was the worst hangover I'd ever gotten so in my sugar. life. Oh, so much awful. sugar. So awful. So awful.